which is uh, Bruno Courcel's hobby. I mean, he was the first to put the emphasis on this. I want to convince you that you know logic even if you don't know logic. There is a famous passage in a comedy by Moliere, Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme, the, the bourgeois as a gentleman, where he doesn't know what is uh, poetry and prose. And then they explain to him that poetry is with rhymes and everything and prose is without. Then he gets very excited. Oh, I spoke prose all the time. <laughs> so, so you should now, after this lecture, you should say, you know, oh, I always speak second order logic <laughs> in, the same, in the same sense. So actually we will, uh, we will look at, uh, uh, we start with graphs, so we have a binary relation on vertices and equality between vertices as the basic statements you can say. Atomic formulas, you can, the only thing you are allowed to say when you speak about graphs proper is you can say that uh, two vertices form or do not form an edge or you can say two vertices are equal or are not equal. So these are called atomic formulas. And the, in general, if you have uh, not graphs but uh, relational structures, depending on, on the format of the structure, you may have some relation with M arguments, and then you can say that M elements of your structure are in this relation or not in this relation. So for instance, if you take a field and you take the addition as a, not as a binary function, but as a ternary relation, you can say a field has a universe and it has two ternary relations. Uh, you can speak about it. the triple is, is of the form A times B equals C or A plus B equals C and so on. And then first of the logic, and you have many, many variables. And the first order logic is you close those statements under Boolean operations. So you can say these two vertices are in the edge and these are not in the edge. But if both are in the edge, then they are equal or something. <laughs> so Boolean operations. And you can also quantify over, over vertices. You can say there exists a vertex such that something, or for every vertex there is something. But you cannot quantify over uh, there is a coloring or there is a, there is a set which is a matching or something. Now second order logic starts off the same, but here you allow to quantify over other relations. So you can say there is a graph and there is an ordering relation such that something happens. You'll see examples. And monadic second order logic is like second order logic, but you can only quantify over subsets of vertices. You cannot quantify over subsets of pairs of vertices. Okay. So this is the general view, but we, we are not going into details now. We, we, we look at this. So a concrete graph, this you should all know, I just want to, a concrete graph is a finite set of points in R3, uh, and, and uh, the edges are kind of ropes <laughs> linking two points in a way that they don't uh, intersect. Okay, so, so for us, a concrete graph really is, a, is, a, is something you can construct with wires by, by, by putting it into three space uh, without gravitation. So if you put an isolated vertex, it shouldn't fall down. And without loss of generality, we can, uh, can take the points in Rm, uh, and the ropes are called arcs, but actually you can, you can prove a theorem that if you have a graph in R uh, in the five dimension, you can also have it uh, as a graph in three dimension, not in two. And then a, a plane graph, you will see in a moment why I do this, all this. A plane graph is given as a set of points in R2, not in R3, and a finite set of arcs linking the, the points in a certain way, again, without intersecting. Now this is in English, it's called a plane graph. So this is still a concrete graph, 
but instead of building it in the three space, you build it on your table. Okay. And all intersection points in the drawing are points of the graph. Now, there is a, there is a problem here which, which we tend to, to overlook, that when you give a definition, in computer science, you will immediately say that you can assume that your uh, sheet of paper has a resolution in pixels, and actually those things are not continuous lines, but they are step functions in pixels. But this doesn't cover all the cases. So the mathematicians originally didn't define plane graphs as pixel graphs the way I draw it, but they also allow, they just want this to be continuous without intersection. But you have space filling curves, you have a, a curve which covers all the points of a space and it's still a line which doesn't <laughs> overlap. So, so if you would say, okay, but what happens if I have a continuous function from here to here, which happens to be some kind of partially space filling or, or something crazy like this. So, so many problems in, in, in geometric uh, graph theory uh, come from the fact that uh, if the mathematician give this definition, but the computer scientist would give the definition which uses a theorem, which is not true. Every continuous function can be represented by a pixel <laughs> because a space filling curve cannot be represented by, by, by pixel functions. So, so but, but uh, maybe this was a mistake of the mathematicians, they were too general, but this creates all kind of, of mathematical problems. So an abstract graph is a, is a pair of sets, uh, vertices and edges, where V is any set and E is, a, is a <coughs> our edges linking to things, it's a relation on V. And uh, so we denote the, the unordered, unordered, this is why I put parentheses here, for unordered graphs it's just pairs of, of, of vertices. And uh, an abstract graph uh, is really what we look at. Now, why, why did I make this distinction? So here is a case of a concrete graph. Now, graph isomorphisms are isomorphisms on abstract graphs. And it is obvious from a concrete graph unless you have space filling curves, but assuming the pixel hypothesis, you can immediately uh, read off uh, uh, an abstract graph and also the abstract graph. In 3D, you can, you can try to, to draw it in a way and then this is all possible. So a graph isomorphism is a map between two abstract graphs, which maps V1 into V2 and for any pair of edges, the, the endpoints are are indeed an edge, if and only if the points here are an edge. Now, uh, in, in, uh, in graph theory, uh, we say a subgraph is a subset for both of them. So you just take a subgraph, so you take a subset of vertices and a subset of edges, and this is a subgraph. In logic, you would never do it like this. <laughs> you would take a subset of vertices and you would take all the pairs uh, which happen to be in the relation, in the, uh, all the pairs which are in the subset but happen to be in the relation in the big graph should be also in the relation in the small graph and this is called in graph theory induced subgraph and if you do the other way around if you uh, if you take a subset here and spanning then, then you, you call it a spanning subgraph. So, so you have three notions of, of, of sub objects, subgraphs, induced subgraphs, and spanning uh, subgraphs. So this is what you know, two graphs are isomorphic, and here is a picture, so this graph is isomorphic to this, and you can write it down in an explicit form. I, I don't have to tell you this in more detail. And here there are more examples, and possible also some missing lines. So. I don't want you to check now. Now, graph properties, if you take Distel's book or Polobar's book or uh, uh, 
Uh, I think those two are actually <laughs> good good cover of current graph theory. Uh, you have uh, properties which you all know. A graph is regular if every two points have the same number of neighbors. Uh, you can look at certain closure properties. Uh, we'll see in a moment. You can look at colorability. You, you have heard of Eulerian and Hamiltonian graphs. You have heard of topological properties of graphs. We have heard of graph miners, hopefully. And, and we will see in a moment how this, this relates to logic. So regularity just says that uh, when we go in steps. So the degree is bounded by d. Every vertex has at most d neighbors. It is k regular if every vertex has exactly k neighbors. It is regular if every vertex has exactly the same number of neighbors, but you don't distinguish. So a graph can be two regular, and, and your friend can be three regular, and uh, another one in my class can be five regular, but, but this is still there, all regular. And regular and degree bounded uh, It's a combination of first and third, right? Yes. Okay, so, so you know this. Now, so we want to show that actually this can be written down in first order logic. We have, we have, we have used this. You have, everybody has seen these definitions in, 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 in textbooks. But I want to just remind you how to do this. So we say that we write some macros. So we write a formula which says that v0 up to vn are all different. And this is easy to write. You write vi is different from vj, and you say and for all those tuples of indices. So yes, uh, i equals 0, and j equals 1, v, and so on. And this is just a big end. You say and for every instance indicated here. This is a finite big end, and it says all points are different. A vertex has degree at most d, is the degree d of v0. It just says what? It says that for every one up to d plus 1 points, vertices, uh, a, uh, if they are connected to v0, and each of them is connected to v0, then uh, at least one pair of those, this is a big OR, at least one pair of those indicated here has to be equal. And a vertex has a degree at least t, you do the same and you say if they are all different, uh, well they are all different and they are all neighbors of the point. So this is just to practice. Uh, so, so the formulas become a bit uh, big, but, but but this is a way of saying natural things you want to say about graphs. So, for so the regular, you just intersection, or is there hmm? for intersection? I, I mean the k regular, that and most e and at least. E. Yeah, you're not intersection and. <laughs> There is a there is a morphism between end and intersection, but <laughs> but here we say end. Okay, and the following graph properties are definable in first order logic. So k regular, you just have seen how to say it, and regular and of bounded degree can also be said because it's, you say for each uh, if one has a degree five, then everybody has degree five, and you say this end for every element smaller than d. But the following are not, and we will have to ask ourselves how we shall do, do this, the following are not definable in first order logic. There is no formula in first order logic such that the formula is true in a graph if and only if the graph is regular. And there is no formula in first order logic which says that each vertex has even degree. So we will have, and this is why logic becomes a bit more relevant, if, if classification according to, to logic is important. We also have to ask ourselves not only how we prove that it can be said, you just say it, <laughs> and 
in cinema moments, sometimes this is highly non-trivial to show that it really says what you mean. But, uh, uh, but we have also to develop a method to show that something is not definable. And uh, there are two classical methods, or two methods. One is a classical method by two mathematicians who both were in Berkeley in the early 50s, Ehrenfeucht and Freise. And then lately there was another method developed, which actually is another way of doing this, but in a more uniform way by connection matrices, which I will explain tomorrow. Now let's look at second order logic. Uh, so here, here we, we practice somehow what we can say in a second order logic. And we want to say two sets AB have the same size, equal, equal size. X. Two sets have the same size. We say there is a relation, R. Now we quantify over a relation which happens to be a function from A to B. And you write down a function. So there is for every A, there is a B. And for every, uh, no, this is always a function. For every A, there is a B. And there are no uh, two Bs which are related to the same A, which is the function property. And you say the function is injective. So also the other way around, if two elements are are the same here. No, if two elements are different here, the values are also different here. And you say it is surjective. It says that every B also comes from some A. So, so this is a first order property using R as a relation. This is a first order property using R as a relation. This is a first order property using R as a relation. And the second order formula says there is an R such that this is true, and this is true, and this is true. Okay. A vertex has even degree. How you would say that the vertex has even degree? Well, there are many ways of saying it, but, but now you have to see this is the stepping stones. You know what it means. But now we have to do, maybe it's not prose, maybe it's poetry. <laughs> we have to say it in, in our language. So we have to say it here. So one way of saying it is even is what? You have a set, you want to say the size is even, so you say there is a partition into two sets, and the two sets are of equal size. So you can say there is an A, a subset, and there is a B, another subset, such that A and B is a partition of something, and A and B have the same size. What is a and we must be the base set of neighbors that can find. Yes, so, so this is for saying even, and now n is the, is the set of neighbors. So you want to say that uh, a vertex has even degree. You want to say that the neighbors can be partitioned into, into a size like this. And two vertices have the same degree. You can say uh, the two neighborhoods of u and v have the same size. So what type of properties do, do graph theorists look like? Now we again look in the book of, of uh, Distel or Bolobash. So they say a graph, uh, a, a graph, a, f a property of graphs, a class of graphs uh, closed under isomorphism is hereditary if it is closed under induced subgraphs. If, if, if you found a graph in it, and I see that there is a subgraph of your graph, uh, an induced subgraph of your graph, then it's also in it, then it's called hereditary. It is monotone if it is closed not only under induced graphs, but under arbitrary subgraphs. And it is monotone discre decreasing it is closed under deletion of edges, but not necessarily of vertices. It is monotone increasing if it is closed under addition of edges, but not necessarily of vertices. And it is additive if it is closed under disjoint union. This all appears in the literature. This is just uh, less frequent. Uh, now here you have some relationship classes, which are monotone, imply that they are hereditary. 
and they are also monotone decreasing and you can play around and ask for other implications. <coughs> now what, what closure properties could you have? Regular graphs are additive in this joint union. No. Three graphs, four graphs. No, 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 I know. But I, I try to think what, what I, what I, whether the devil again played a trick here or whether I, <laughs> or I had something in mind. But uh, it seems no, I, I don't. Uh, regular graphs are. Uh, K regular graphs. Yeah, it says K regular graphs <laughs> are additive. You see, there, there is a difference here. If an unlearned reader finds a mistake, he screams, the writer is stupid. <laughs> if a reader assumes that the writer was not so stupid, he reads and sees a contradiction and says, well, maybe I can see what, what, <laughs> what was forgotten. Now, this is important because in the good old times, people refereed papers under the assumption that the author was more intelligent than the referee. And today, in, in, especially in computer science, in many refereed conferences, many young referees are so convinced that they are more intelligent than the author that they, they would reject the paper because of a statement like this <laughs> without saying that, you know, unfortunately he omitted a, a letter here. <laughs> and this really happens, this is not funny. <laughs> So graphs of bounded degree, let's see, I hope there is no misprint here. Graphs of bounded degree D are monotone, and they are also additive. Cliques are hereditary, but not monotone. Connectivity is only monotone, increasing. Exercise, check the above closure properties of graph properties. Or maybe the idea was here to make a mistake on purpose, because <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I, I put some uh, exercises here. Now there is something which the graph theorists, we will see in a moment, uh, but uh, the disclosure properties don't imply necessarily uh, necessary definability in logic, so, so we have to ask this. But graph theorists like very much the following type of notion, let H be any family, I, I make it index, but fa any family of your favorite graphs. Now then we denote forbidden for subgraphs or forbidden for induced subgraphs, or you can also do forbidden for uh, spanning subgraphs if you want, but this is less used in literature. It is the class of graphs which have no subgraph isomorphic to somebody here. Okay, so for instance, the graph without edges can be defined as forbidden one edge. It's all the graphs where there is no subgraph which consists of one edge. Uh, the uh, how do you want? Uh, well, we we'll try in a moment. <laughs> I don't want to improvise now. So anyhow, so forbidden. Forbidden subgraph is monotone, and forbidden induced subgraph is hereditary by definition almost. So here you can do some exercise. Let P a monotone or hereditary graph property. Then there exists a family. I don't say anything about the size, it's just there is a family of finite graphs such that P is the class of forbidden subgraphs. And uh, this is just analyzing what goes is an easy exercise, and I leave it to you as an exercise, and I hope you have seen it before. But the point I want to make is if, if you have only a finite set of forbidden uh, graphs, then both forbidden subgraph and forbidden induced subgraph are definable in first order logic. 
how do you write down uh, that uh, my my graph is triangle free? Triangle free just says there are no no induced subgraphs which are triangles. So you want to write it down in first order logic. So write down the negation. There is a triangle. There exist three points different and pairwise they are connected by an edge. And then you put a negation in front of it and you say my graph satisfy the property. There are no three points such that they form a triangle. So in general and, and if you have many of those you do it for each of them again and you put an end and this is finite and then it is first order defined. So we have forbidden subgraphs uh, or induced subgraphs in general you can also show that uh, if it is like this and it cannot be written like this then it cannot be done in first order logic. So here is some, some homework uh, <laughs> which you can try to do. You can try to define forests by forbidden subgraphs. You can define cliques by forbidden subgraphs. You can uh, play around and find examples and if you are lazy you can go to a book which is very useful uh, and it's really a catalog, it's not a textbook and it's a very very useful catalog which classifies graph properties according to variants of criteria. There is a very long chapter on, on forbidden uh, uh, subgraphs. So here is a classical thing you know. A graph is three colorable and now we can try to say this in, in logic and we say very simply there exist three colors so the colors are now the color sets you, the, you see that there is a point here in, in uh, I lost again my chalk here if you if you uh, if you define coloring like this three colors would be like this you map so all those go here and all those go here and all those go here. This looks like a function. But you, if you know that there are only three elements here, you don't know, you don't need those elements. You just can say there is a partition of the graph into three sets and each set induces an independent set. So you can write it down as there is a set one and there is a set two and there is a set three such that blah, blah, blah and you can write it down in monadic second order logic. Maybe you might want to explain why this set is a relation of LT1 just to illustrate why monadic second order logic is a second order logic? No, no, I said <laughs> this, is, this is a yeah. subset. Yeah. So you write there is a set S1 and there is a set S2 and there is a set S3. Each of them are subsets of V such that uh, independent uh, S1 and independent S2 and independent S3 and these are macros of saying that uh, all the points in S1 are not related to each other by, by members of S1. And uh, the P colorings we have seen before with a fixed number of colors can be done the same. You write down so this three colorable by P property instead of independent. So this you can do. And if P is definable in first order logic, <coughs> then it is still monadic second order logic. And if P is definable in second order logic, then the whole thing is also definable in second order logic. So all the P colorings you have seen before are, no, not all of them, but all the second order properties P give me a uh, property like this, which is also second order definable. Okay, so here it says it is not definable in monadic if you only assume that P is second order logic. But, but you have to be careful and then you can but also get this. Now I want to get somewhere 
So here I have some more details how it is done, but I have sketched this, so I'll jump here. Uh, and so here is another one, chordality. A graph is, simple, is a simple cycle of length k if it is a cycle of length k. A graph is a simple cycle if it is connected and too regular. So a graph is chordal or triangulated if there is no induced subgraph of G isomorphic to a simple cycle of length at most four in the finition. So you, uh, here is a, now obviously this can be written down as a, as a forbidden uh, subgraph property, but then it needs infinitely many forbidden things. And here I give an ex, uh, find an MSOL expression for chordality. So, so can you can you do this in uh, in monadic second order logic? And the answer is uh, yes, but it needs some effort. So let's leave it for a moment. Uh, a classical thing you would like is Eulerian. We can follow each edge exactly once pass through all the edges and return to the point of departure. Now, if I ask you to translate this into logic, you will be hard pressed. So the natural language definition Euler would give is a bit awkward. However, Euler proved the theorem, a graph is Eulerian in this definition, if and only if it is connected and each vertex has even degree. So this gives us a clue of saying Eulerian not following the natural language definition, but using the theorem. Okay. So it shows to you that something which is very intuitive in natural language may be, and we will see even more dramatic examples, may be very hard to say in, in, in second order or monadic second order logic unless you have a, a theorem which tells you how to do it. Now Hamiltonian, we can follow the edges visiting each vertex exactly once and return to the point of departure. Again, this is funny, but if you, how can you say this? Don't translate this, this statement. This is on purpose. The examples are here that you have to think and you don't translate it like this. But then you, you want to have a quantification over the edge set? Or, uh, we'll see what we need. How would you say Hamiltonian? Hamiltonian means that you can draw the graph like this. Here is an edge, 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 here is an edge. Here is an edge, here is an edge, and here is an edge. And then there are the, uh, yes, you have visited everybody, but there may be other edges. So what do you have to say? You want to say there is a linear ordering of the of the edges, which somehow is compatible with the with the edge relation. So you say there is a subset of edges which satisfy of no you sorry no you said a, a linear ordering such that it's compatible with this. So it's a subset of three times three. Hmm? It's a subset of three times three, which satisfies the axioms of linear order and do something. Or is that what you want to do? Or Now 
So here you say there is a, you say one, two, three, four, up to whatever n, and you say there is an ordering of the vertices such that a, uh, he is a successor of his, implies that there is an edge here. And then you, you get Hamiltonicity. And uh, you said there is a binary relation on vertices, which is not necessarily a, and, and, uh, which are edges, yes, actually. So in this sense, you say actually what? You say there is a subset of E, those, such that S is a ordering, a total ordering of the vertices of the endpoints of the edges. No, maybe you want to have a subset of V times V, because E is that. No, no, but I want afterwards, I want this remark of Courcel that Hamiltonicity is monadic second order if you allow quantify over edges and okay. <laughs> so, you are right what you say, but <laughs> I, have, I have my point. So here you really say there is a subset of edges which happens to be a linear ordering of the, of the, of the vertices. The subset of edges is a set of pairs and a set of pairs can be a linear ordering or not. I mean, you can take a subset of edges where uh, it's connected and re too regular. Also, yes. yes. Yeah. Now, for Eulerian, you, you go... You do the same, but you use the theorem before and we have to use the fact that, uh, that we can say linear order and first order and everything. Uh, here we say what? We say, well, then we can follow each edge exactly once, pass through all the edges. We can order all the edges and choose beginning and end of the edge such that for all i this is true and then we write down this sentence. But we have to quantify over, over a binary relation here, which doesn't have to be a, a binary relation, and it's not on the edges. Okay, here is a subtle point I want to make. In, in the graph literature, you can look at graphs with universe V and the binary relation for edges but then you don't have multiple edges. Or you can look at it as a kind of hypergraphs where you have two universes, V and E, and the ternary or a binary relation, however you want to code it, which says that an edge has a beginning point and an end point, uh, like this. Now, this is different in the sense the monadic logic of this doesn't allow you to quantify over edges, but the monadic logic over this allows you to quantify over subsets of this and over subsets of this. So it does allow you to quantify over subsets of edges, but not over arbitrary subsets of pairs. So a graph can be used, looked at as a hypergraph, so we call it an H-graph, uh, and this is a bit more general. Now, now, there is a way of translating one into the other, but, but the translation is in second order logic. So if you want to be subtle about logic, this is a subtle difference, and actually one can show that uh, Hamiltonicity is monadic second order definable as hypergraphs, but not as graphs, and uh, Eulerian is not definable in monadic second order logic in neither of the presentations. So this is just a picture to show the difference between hypergraph and graph. If you have a graph here, so the vertices are those things, and you make a hypergraph out of it, and those vertices become those vertices, but the edges you have here become edges, and actually you can look at this again as a graph, 
And this is the R relation which says that uh, this is an endpoint of this and this is an endpoint of this. And, uh, but it's, it's quite different as a structure from a logical point of view. So I have some exercise you can look at those slides. I want to make a point here now, which is quite subtle. How much I have to have? You give me? Uh, you have to give me the break back. <laughs> 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 so here are topological properties of graphs. So if you already put it also on, on video, I have to give credit where I took the pictures from. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so a graph is planar if it is isomorphic to a plane graph. A graph is a genus graph if it can be drawn not on the plane or on the ball, but on, on, a, on a bagel like this or as a thing like this. Now planar graphs uh, is isomorphic to plane graphs. And uh, the question is, can you say planar graph in logic? Now, if you tell the story of being planar graph, there is no clue of how to say it in logic because it says, here is my Euclidean space, <laughs> here is my Euclidean plane, here is my graph, <laughs> here is a function which involves continuity and everything and everything. How can you say this in the language of graphs? There are too many objects around. There are, there, it there doesn't talk about graphs, it talks about graphs being, concrete graphs being represented in a topological way. So how could we express planarity in logic? And here comes the, the, the surprise is that uh, you will have to use a heavy theorem. A heavy theorem, as I once tried to do it in, uh, in class, not with the pixel approximation, but with the proper uh, topological approximation. And you can look it up in Distel's book. It's a heavy theorem, even if you, if you use the top topological facts. So Kuratowski, you ask when he died. <laughs> Kuratowski uh, uh, proved in the 20s a theorem which looked at the following. It, it looked at the subdivision of a graph. So if I have a graph like this, I, I am allowed to do the following. Along an edge, I can uh, this is an express train and I say, okay, but uh, today is Sunday, we go slowly. So it stops also here, it stops here, it stops here. So a subdivision of a graph is simply on every edge you put in additional stations. And uh, so, so this is a subdivision of this. So, okay. The theorem says a finite graph G is planar if and only if it does not contain a subgraph that is isomorphic to a subdivision of K5 or K33. This is the original Kuratowski theorem. Okay, so now th this is really a major achievement because this theorem says planarity can be expressed in a way that I don't speak about uh, the, the embedding in, in, in space. This is really only speaking about graph. No, I have to speak about subdivisions, but, but you know, this is a... So, so the, the point here is that using this theorem, you can... And you prove this theorem in your course? You can uh, show that it is definable in monadic second order. And we use Kuratowski theorem. And we note that for a fixed graph, G is a subdivision of H, is definable in monadic second order logic. And then you, you write down the, there is a whatever you need. So this can be done here. Now this is a case where, where uh, writing down in one of the second order logic uh, uses a very heavy theorem. Now if you go back and you say, OK, now a graph has genus 2, uh, can we do this in monadic second order logic? Then you would have to ask, well, but this is even more complicated. I have to write down this bagel and I have to, 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 to write a formula, but then it gets very heavy and you use the graph minus theorem and, uh, OK, 
okay, you want me to stop? So people know what are graph miners? Um, maybe, yeah. <laughs> so graph miners are a generalization of what we saw with subdivisions. And anyhow, there is a celebrated theorem. Is there already a textbook which has the complete theorem in, in, in seminar form, which can be done in nice portions? <laughs> huh? no. try, in the fourth edition of this it goes very far. Yeah, yeah what the theorem says that uh, let me P any graph property which is closed under minus. Minus is taking subgraphs and, uh, and contracting edges. Uh, so forbidden minorism is, says uh, graph proper closed under minors. And the theorem, which sounds very harmless if you write it like here, is every graph property closed under minors can be written, well, this we know as an exercise by an infinite set of forbidden minors. But the theorem says actually in every case here, you can do it with a finite case. And this is a very, very, very heavy theorem. But it turns out that, like we saw before with the subdivision, saying that I am a minor of this and this form is expressible in monadic second order logic. And therefore, this theorem implies that every minor class, minor closed class of, of uh, graph properties can be expressed in monadic second order logic. And that you can draw a graph on a, on a, on a, on a genus something is minor closed is now easy to see because you draw it and then you start to reduce and you see that you don't fall off the, the surface where you have drawn the graph. So this just shows you that in some sense monadic second order or second order logic are very natural, but in some cases there are graph properties which can be expressed in logic. But the way how to express it is A, highly non-obvious, <coughs> and B, it's not even clear how big the formula will be. So, so here the theorem says H is finite, but actually if I give you any minor closed class, and I just have seen, so you take genus 17, and you want to know how many minors you have to exclude, I think this is an open problem, people haven't for, for genus 2, 3, 4, I think they have computed it, but so anyhow, you take a bigger number, genus 100, <laughs> and then you know there is some formula, but you have absolutely no idea how it looks like. Okay, so, so this is just about, about uh, logic. So there are some more remarks here. What I want to mention is simply that in complexity theory, uh, they, they relate uh, graph properties or general structures to, to definability. So there is a theorem by Fagin and Christen, though usually it's, he is not given credit for it, uh, which says that the property of graphs is in NP uh, if and only if it is definable in existential second order logic. Existential means you can only use existential quantifiers at the beginning of the formula, but you can quantify on arbitrary arity of relations. So this gives you a logical characterization of NP in terms of logic. And then there is a Meyer-Stockmeyer. If you take the polynomial hierarchy, never mind what it is for the moment, is there exactly the things which are in second order logic definable. And I've shown once with a student of mine that uh, a hierarchy here uh, uh, for every level you can actually already find monadic second order formula in, in the hierarchy which is complete this shows that the monadic hypothesis and the complexity uh, don't uh, are orthogonal to each other I mean here the number of quantif not the number but the structure of quantification help something. Here the structure of quantification is arbitrary, but uh, the fact that you restrict to monadic doesn't help anything in, in, in complexity theory, but it helps in other aspects of, of graph theory. 
So there is a there is one challenge I want to. You know the game of hex or the game of geography? Huh? Geography is the game you play uh, with children. You you you. I don't know if it goes with the Korean alphabet, but <laughs> but in the Latin alphabet you you say a country, America. It starts with A and ends with A. Now you have to say a country which starts with A, and then you say Asia. So he has to say, and I know Asia is not a country, whatever. You say A, uh, Aden, and then you uh, you start with N. You have to say a country which starts with N, Norway, and you have to say a country which starts with Y, and you look for it. Okay, Yalta. No, <laughs> and if you can't do it anymore, you you lose. And you may not repeat countries. So, so you can define this as a graph. You take an arbitrary graph. You pick a point. You have to pick a neighbor of the point. The next uh, the player again has to pick a neighbor. And you have to try to pick neighbor. And you lose when you pick something which has already been picked. And uh, for arbitrary graph, you have this game. And you want to know whether a graph is a winning position for player one or player two, and this has been shown to be uh, P space complete. Now the challenge is, can you define the graphs for which geography has a winning strategy for player one in second order logic? And to, to uh, well, if I want to encourage you, is as would say now go home and think. If I want to discourage you, which is a uh, wrong thing to do also, I would tell you, you shouldn't try too hard. Because if you can do it, you show that the polynomial hierarchy equals P space. <laughs> <laughs> which would, would give you a big price in computers. So <laughs> it's not as bad as P, P, P equals NP, but it will be a big breakthrough. Okay. But you see, usually this is a stupid argument to say, <gasps> I don't touch it, it's NP complete. It just says, be careful, it's NP complete. But you still may look at it and maybe you can discover something about it. But this is the genuine test. So there, are, there is a variation with the geography game and the hex is a bit more complicated to explain. But these are two games where the winning, recognizing the winning positions is P space complete. And it is a big challenge because of the theorem I mentioned before to show or to disprove that the winning positions of these games are second order definable graph properties. Okay, this is for today. Mm -hmm.